Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24 to 26. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. We've been teaching from Hebrews chapter 11, as you know, about the life of faith. Living by faith is what we have titled this whole uh, series of sermons. Hebrews 11, as you know, is a great chapter on faith. And uh, we've been sharing much about faith from this particular chapter. We looked at Abraham and his faith, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Now we are looking at Moses. Last week we looked at the faith of Moses' parents, which is very important because it tells us how important the parents' faith is when we raise our children. We taught from 23rd verse where it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. They hid the child by faith, it says, not because they feared that the child may be killed. They hid him because of faith. And I showed you how that act of hiding the child was an act of faith because God had promised Abraham long back before the deliverance of the people of Israel happened, God promised Abraham that his descendants will be there in a foreign land for 400 years. And there, the people of that land will afflict them and then God will judge them and then bring them out in the fourth generation, 400 years later, back into the land of Canaan. Now this was known in the days of Abraham and passed on to Isaac, Jacob and then Joseph days and Joseph's days and then later on, to the succeeding generations, it was made known. So they were expecting that. So when the time came, they knew that the deliverance is supposed to happen any time. When the king passed the order to kill all the children, they looked at God's timetable and they knew that 400 years are going to be fulfilled now. The time of deliverance is anytime soon. It may be in the days of Moses, they realized, because God's calendar shows that it's approaching 400 years. So when Moses was born, they realized that the timing is very crucial and the deliverance is going to happen. They believed in God's promises. That is why the Bible says they by faith did it. Plus, God would have shown them in some other way something about Moses and God's purposes for them. And Jewish history, I mean, Jewish tradition says that the parents had a vision from God about the special purposes that God had for Moses and so on. And they saw that the child was a beautiful child. I explained what the beautiful child meant. Beautiful not in the sense of just outward beauty. It was a special child with a special purpose. They realized that God had a purpose for this child and called this child for something very uh, unusual. They saw that God's hand was upon the child. Some English translators, translators suggest that it must be translated as beautiful to God. The child was beautiful to God in the sense that in God's sight, the child was an important child with a very special purpose. Because of that reason, they hid the child. So the faith of Moses' parents was very important, you know, because when he grew up, since he was raised by his own parents, even though the king's daughter has taken him to be his son, she has employed his own mother to raise him and then turn him into, uh, to turn him back to her. So he was raised in his own home in the influence of his father and mother. Therefore, the faith of his parents played a major role in his life. So when he grew up, now he's going to he's making some decisions significant decisions because of faith 
That is what we're going to look at. Now, today, right now we're going to look at something that is new about faith. You know, we have looked at faith which has to do with salvation, the experience of salvation. Now, we are saved by grace through faith. Faith is a means through which God saves us. Grace gives us the salvation and faith helps us to take salvation. We saw how faith is useful when it comes to receiving salvation. We see in the Bible, faith is necessary to receive healing. Faith is necessary to receive deliverance of all kinds. Jesus asked the people that came for deliverance or came for healing to him, said, do you believe that I can do this for you? They said, I believe, you know. One fellow said, I, I believe, Lord help my unbelief. You know, it was important that they believed. And faith was necessary for all those things. So we have heard about faith being used as an instrument through which salvation happens, healing happens, deliverance happens, miracles happen, unusual things happen by faith. We know that. But today we're going to look at a new thing about faith. The thing that is shown here in the life of Moses about faith is that faith shows itself here as a definite decision of the mind. It's not just believing something. Faith is a definite decision of the mind. It is seen as an act of the will here in this instance and as a personal and studied choice. It's not simply believing something. It is something that a person comes to as a result of a decision that he has made with his mind because of faith. It's an act of his will. It is a personal and studied choice. I want to show you that. Now, a lot of people don't think about faith like that. They think about faith bringing healing, faith bringing deliverance, miracles and all of that. But we want to see faith as something that helps us to make a very studied personal choice. Faith as a decision of the mind. Faith as an act of the will where you decide, make some crucial decisions about your life and living. <clears throat> so Moses here is seen in this passage that I just read to you. It says that by faith when Moses became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He's making a very crucial decision. He decides that he will not be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. So here you see faith as a deliberate renunciation and turning away from all that is opposed to God. A determination to utterly deny self and to choose to submit to God in every way. This is the thing that faith enabled Moses to do. It enabled Moses to deliberately renounce, turn away from all that is opposed to God, all that is ungodly, and make a determination to utterly deny self, selfish ambitions, and to submit himself to God in everything. So that's what we're going to see. So we're going to look at two things. His refusal to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, on the one hand, and on the other hand, his choosing rather to suffer affliction. He refuses one thing and chooses another thing. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize, I, you know, I've taught a lot on faith, and uh, this is one aspect that is not taught much, I realize. We teach about faith bringing healing and all these things. But the thing is, this is one aspect that's very important for our Christian growth and Christian life. This aspect of faith helping us to determine to submit to God in everything and renounce all that is ungodly, to turn away from all that is ungodly, to choose to serve God, to deny yourself and to take up the cross and to follow and so on. Um, but that is the way the Bible teaches. Faith enables it. A man walking by faith, living by faith, is enabled by his faith to do these things. Now that is the new thing about faith that we're going to look at today. Philippians chapter 3 is a wonderful example of this. Philippians 
chapter 3. Paul exhibits the same qualities here and his words are even more powerful there. Philippians chapter 3 and let me read to you from verse 7. As you know, Paul comes from a very uh, wealthy family, a privileged family. His family seemed to have obtained Roman citizenship because of their status. Back in those days when Rome ruled the world, they took some people, important people from certain communities, like the Jewish communities, which are minorities, chose some important people and bestowed upon them citizenship as an honor, citizenship of Rome. So that these people will side with them when issues came up, you know, when some conflict came uh, with those communities, with the Roman government, that these people will support them and uh, bring their community with them to support the Roman government. So they favored them with uh, this privilege of having the Roman citizenship, which was considered a great thing back then. So Paul's parents seem to have obtained the citizenship in that way. And Paul was born into that citizen, as citizenship, as a Roman citizen. That speaks and tells us of what a privileged family he comes from. He must have come from a very esteemed family, wealthy family, influential family among the Jewish people. And here he is a greatly educated man, very well learned, known for his zeal and is known for his education and knowledge. And look at what he says as he turned Christian. This is what he says. When he became a Christian, he has changed. Look at what he says in chapter 3 and verse 7 onwards. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Now the world considers certain things as gain. I'm going to share about that. But let's think in this way. The world considers certain things as gain. That is, they think of some things as very important, very significant. All right. And he says, I used to think of certain things as gain. Something, uh, I used to think of certain things as important when I didn't know Christ. But those things I have counted as loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He says, after coming to Christ, I see that when compared to the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, those things are rubbish. When I compare what I have received through Jesus, the blessings, the uh, good things that I've received through Jesus Christ. And I compare that with what I've got in the worldly way, what I used to think as big things in the world, significant things in this world, such as who I am in terms of which tribe I belong to, that I'm a Pharisee, belong to the tribe of Benjamin, that I'm an educated man, very cultured person, raised in a very high-class family, and all of that. He used to take pride in that. He called himself Pharisee of Pharisees, impeccable according to the law, and so on. He says, these things I considered very important, very significant to me. My education, my status, my tribe, my origin, all of these things were important to me. My religious faith and belief, my zeal. He says in one place, I am more zealous than my elders in my faith, Jewish faith he is talking about. So such a man who boasted about all these things, who cared about all these things, considered these things great. Now he says, I consider them all rubbish. Why? In light of the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now I've come to know Christ and I look at those things in light of what Christ means to me and the blessings that come through Christ. Those things are nothing. The things that I have in this world, my status, my, all my things that, that I used to think as big, means nothing to me, he says. And then, listen to this very interesting passage. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, verse 9, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him. 
Now my biggest pursuit is not all those things. I used to pursue those other things because I thought they were big things before. But now I know something about the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. So my life's first pursuit has been to know Christ, he says. I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I want to know, he says, something about his sufferings. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know something about his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. All right. Now this tells us that when a person comes to faith in Christ and when faith comes into that person, the saving faith, and when a person truly believes in Jesus Christ, it makes us dead to the world and all the interests and honors that the world affords to us. He's totally dead to the world. He's, it, he's turned off from those things. He used to think those things were great, but now his whole perspective has changed. That's nothing, he says. So true faith is not just a certainty and assurance. The Bible says it is a certainty. It is an assurance. But it is much more than that. That is why Hebrews 11 is very important, you know. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yes, that is true. But it is in the examples, when you look at the examples, it shows that it has something more to it also. And what is that? Faith is something that weans us away from the world. It brings us away from the world, makes us realize what is more important in life, makes us look at the world and the things that we used to think as great and big and significant become dim and become useless and become literally rubbish in Paul's language when compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, because the perspective has changed, now Paul is ready to even lose his life for Jesus. Now ready to lose anything, all the privileges that he enjoys, all the good things in life, everything that he has, he has had the privilege of enjoying, the good life and everything. He says, if I have to choose between all these things that God has given to me and Christ, if there ever was a conflict between what I have in this world and what I enjoy in this world and Christ and the knowledge of Christ, when such a conflict arises, I will always choose Christ, he says. I'm ready to give up everything to choose Christ. Because to me now, Christ is much bigger and the blessings of Christ is much bigger than everything and anything in this world. That's the whole point of this Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 to 26, where it says, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. This is the essence of the teaching there, all right? Now, <laughs> Jesus also puts it in his own way. Paul, you've seen Paul and how he puts it powerfully, but look at Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, and verse 24. Now, this is in the context of, you know, you remember Jesus at one point started telling the disciples about his death. He tells them, he began to tell and show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He's talking about what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And immediately Peter pulls him to the side and he says, look, don't talk like that. This must not happen to you. you know, far be it to you. But far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. And Jesus replies to that. You know that famous 
So he says, get behind me, Satan, he says to Peter. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Your, your thinking is different, he says. You are thinking in human way, that I'm going to die and I'm going to suffer and these things bother you. You're thinking in a human way. I'm thinking in a different way. My, I'm, go, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. But I'm going to be risen again. And so many people are going to receive salvation through my death and my resurrection. So many glorious things are going to happen. God is going to later honor, honor me, raise me up and raise me and put me as an, and give me the name above all name and exalt me to his right hand and honor me and restore my honor to me. I'm thinking about all that, not just thinking about suffering and dying, but you're thinking like just an ordinary man that I'm going to suffer and die. And so he rebukes him. And then only this verse comes. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Very famous verse. But the thing is, have we really understood this verse? You know, everybody likes to talk about this. Jesus said that if anyone desires to come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do we understand what taking up his cross and following Christ is all about? Do we understand what it is to deny yourself and take up his cross and follow, to take up his cross and follow? See, on the one hand, you got to deny, and then on the other hand, you have to take up. You have to leave something. You have to do something. You have to refuse something, you have to choose something, which is exactly what Moses did. Deny yourself, take up the cross and follow. What does it mean? What does it mean to deny yourself? It simply means that if you want to follow me, Jesus says, you lay down your agenda, your program, your wishes and your plans and your purpose and all these things. And because you've given your life to me, because you're given your life to God. Now, don't live for yourself. Live for God, God's purposes. So lay down your purposes and take up God's purposes. That's the only way to follow Jesus. You can't just on the surface for namesake be a follower of Christ. You cannot just have a Christian name and say that you're a follower of Christ. A true follower of Christ is one who denies himself. He feels that he has no personal agenda. He has no plan. He has no purpose other than the plan and purpose that God has for him. That is a true Christian. Because his life is not lived for his sake, but his life is lived for God's sake. For God's purposes. That's a true Christian. Deny himself means, let him deny himself means, let him deny the right to live his own life. But let him come under subjection to God, submit himself to God, and live the life that God wants him to live. That's what it means. That's true Christianity. That is true Christian life. Let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Now, when you deny yourself, your, all the things that you think is very important, like Paul, you know, a lot of us have our own ideas, you know. We think this is important, that is important, this is significant, that is great, this is big. In our eyes, so many things look big, important. When you deny, when you say, no, I don't want all that. I want what God wants for me. Sometimes what happens when what God wants doesn't look good, doesn't look like a great prospect. You read the stories of all the missionaries that came and worked in India and so on, you know. I was reading about the missionary that established the CMC hospital, you know. There was a doctor who came actually and worked there and his daughter watched these women die because they don't have a, they don't have a lady doctor to take care of their needs like childbirth and so on. And she was moved in her heart as she saw them that she wanted to do something. And she put down all her ambition to be this and that and everything and goes back to America and studies medicine for the purpose of coming and serving women here. <laughs> How many of you choose college and profession like that? <laughs> here is a woman highly purposeful, 
knows God. She knows exactly what she's going to do. She's going to study and come back here and be a doctor to these women who don't have doctors and, and they're dying. She goes and studies. She's very steady in her mind. She's very purposeful, comes back here and serves. And that's how this great hospital that serves so many people today and some of the greatest doctors and medical treatment is available in that hospital today. People from all over the world come. In this part of the world, at least in Asia, it's a big thing. People come there and receive benefits today. In America, if you're a doctor, you're equal to a Hollywood actor, you know. No difference between doctors and actors there because doctors are very, I mean, if you're a doctor, you can really do well there. Earnings are on a different level, you know. And uh, her mind didn't work like that. Her mind worked in this way, that she wanted to... It is not wrong to, you know, go to America and, and be a doctor and earn so much and all. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that for this woman, she felt a call in her life that she must do this, that God had spoken in her heart and she has done this. She was moved in her heart to do that. And she came back and she started doing that. She could have lived very comfortably there and she could have had everything she wanted. Life is a bit difficult here. I think you would agree. It's a lot more difficult here. Yeah? Take the heat, for example, you know. With all the other problems, but she didn't mind anything. She sacrificed all her comforts, everything, and came and served here to serve people and to serve God and to do the will of God. So, when you leave your purposes, your desires, and take up God's will, sometimes God's will seems like the cross. That's why it says, deny yourself, take up the cross. You ask her, it'll, she'll say, yeah, that was like a taking up the cross. It was difficult. But whoever takes up the cross will never fail. That's another thing that's wonderful about it. You will never see a person denying himself, taking up a cross and become a failure. Look at what she has done. Look at the big hospital. Look, look at what they are doing. Look at the, the kind of institution that it is today. Look at the name and the fame that that place has today. Look at the glory of God that comes through all of this. Because someone denies themselves to take up the cross. You know, take up the cross is, you know, for a lot of people it looks like, wow, it's terrible, you know. Take up the cross, brother, don't preach about taking up the cross. <laughs> what it is saying basically is, it is always difficult to put down our wishes, our desires, what we want to do. And take up someone else's wishes and accomplish it. And that is God's wishes. God's wishes for us may not be very attractive to us. We may not say the, see the end result now. <laughs> we may see only the trouble. I remember I myself, when I was growing up, I had perfectly everything planned, you know. I'm a good planner. And I thought I was very wise. I planned my life to be in a certain place and to do certain things and what my profession would be. One of the things I planned was never to be a pastor. <laughs> That's like punishment job. If God wanted to punish somebody, he made them a pastor, I thought. So I said, God, no pastor. I got other plans. I want to be an evangelist. I want to be a nice evangelist. Preach the gospel. I loved doing that. And I was traveling and preaching. And uh, really going around. And it was a blessing to people also. Wherever I went, things happened. And good things happened and so on. And I went to one little church. And they wanted me to be a pastor. They, those guys... The elders of the church got together and told me, God told us that you must be our pastor. I said, God never told me that, brother. You better know that God never told me. He won't tell me that because he knows that I don't want that. He said, no, how come God told us that you'll be our pastor? I said, my God, man, you're talking about something that I don't want. I told them I don't have any experience as a pastor, never been a pastor. I don't know how to be a pastor. I just got out of college. I just, I just know a little bit to preach the gospel. So I'm just doing that. Don't call me to be your pastor. They said, no, we want you to be our pastor. All Americans, you know, that too. 
not one indian there and nothing you know totally different culture people of different culture said we want you to be our pastor god told us so i ended up as a pastor took up something that i didn't like but in one year god convinced me that this was what i was called to do in one year i came to know that this is what i'm supposed to do i saw that i am called to do this i loved it i loved preaching to the same people again and again you know over an extended period of time instead of going to new people every time you know and having just 10 sermons and preaching the same thing all over everywhere but staying in one place and preaching every sunday every thursday there and so on i preached all those services morning evening thursday and i enjoyed it and it, there was great was the result it was only 25 people we became 200 people in one year and i was thrilled and i said wonderful and i was thinking that i was getting settled down and things were working well and then god showed me i got another one for you you got to go here and be a pastor now that was not in my plan <laughs> you always think that is bad you know my mind had it fixed in it that this is bad it's a bad idea don't do that every nerve in my body said don't do that it's a bad idea but that is the best and when i came here believe me it was carrying the cross i carried the cross for many years <laughs> i have i know what it means to deny yourself and carry the cross and follow jesus because it was like carrying the cross a lot of trouble but i tell you today i look back i wouldn't do it any other way god's plan is the best plan it brings the greatest success it brings the greatest joy it brings the greatest fulfillment that's the greatest thing i'm convinced that to truly follow jesus you need to deny yourself you need to learn to walk by walking by faith is this living by faith is this kind of life that you don't just go around just doing your what you want to do but you always seek god to know what he wants you to do where to go what to do what to take up denying yourself and take up the cross and i'll tell you whoever takes up the cross will never fail cross cross will lead to death and death to self right and that's good death to selfish ambitions and that will lead to a resurrection and that will lead to glory that will lead to exaltation that will lead to blessing all these things follow the cross a lot of people don't they stop with the cross one fellow said i preach the cross he said don't stop there keep going you know preach the resurrection preach the exaltation preach the glorification preach everything that comes after that because he humbled himself even to the death on the cross god also therefore highly exalted him philippians 2:5 says gave him given him a name above every name so that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father amen so cross always leads to glorious results never be afraid to take up the cross i encourage you never be afraid to deny yourself never be afraid to put down your will never be afraid to say lord not my will your will be done jesus said that he is not a loser never be afraid to deny yourself the right to do what you want to do and take up what god wants you to do never be afraid of it the devil will tell you a thousand things people will tell you all kinds of things don't do it don't do it. this is not a good idea. no never be afraid of denying yourself and taking up the cross to follow jesus and i tell you that is when you experience true results of faith living amen now the thing doesn't end there he says if anyone wants to follow me let him deny himself take up the cross and follow me all right and then he continues he mentions interestingly three 
things that people of this world consider as very significant and important. Three things that people consider as very significant and important. And uh, he points out, see, that's the essence of life. These three things make life what it is, basically. That's what he seems to think. So he's pointing out these three things. If in these three areas of life, you establish that God is supreme, not you, you give first place to God in these three things in life, then I'll tell you, then you will see great results. That is what true living by faith is all about. Let me mention these three things to you. We just read verse 24, right? Take up the cross and follow me. Look at verse 25. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whosoever, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Have you ever thought about what it means? Here he is talking about the number one thing that people consider big, life. Have you heard of people talking about getting a life? My life? I want to establish my life. I want to pay attention to my life. My life, me, my, me, I, you know. One person was getting divorced and he said to, she said to everybody else, well, finally I'm getting a divorce because all this while I lived for this guy, now I'm going to live for myself. My life. Now I'm going to live my life. Oh, that's where, that's, now you're going to start losing. That's the thing. See, when it's your life, it always ends in a disaster. When you live it for yourself, it always ends in a disaster. That's what Jesus is teaching. If a man wants to save his life, he will lose it. That means if you want to get a life, people do all kinds of things to get a life. They go here and there, turn, you know, uh, I mean, they try all kinds of things and pull down people and destroy people and do all kinds of things, you know, to get a life for themselves. They say, I don't care about what happens to anybody. My life, I want to get a life. I want to get myself established. I want to get my life. My life, my life, me, I. <laughs> they want to get a life because life is very important to them. It's a big thing for them. Life. Everybody's trying to establish their life. Find this life. And Jesus says, if you desire to save your life, you will lose it. And if you lose your life, you're ready to lose your life. For my sake, that's the key. You'll find it. In other words, he says, you want to get a life, you run here and there and try everything, you're not going to get it, man. You're going to lose it, he says. But if you're ready to lose your life for my sake, that means if you will today say, Lord, not my will, I give my life to you. Not my life anymore. I will not think about my life as my life anymore. I will think of my life as life given into your hands. You are the Lord of my life. Today, I give myself to you. You are my Lord and my master. You tell me where I should go, what I should do. I will live like that for your sake. I'm ready to even lose my life. If you do that, he says, you'll gain it. You'll get what you're running out, running everywhere for what you're searching for, what you're trying so hard for. The moment you give your life to Jesus and then literally deny yourself and take up the cross and you say, my life is not my life, it's his life. He's the Lord. He tells me to go, I go. He tells me to do, I do. When you live it like that, he says, now only you're going to see success. It may look like it's tough, it may look like he's telling you to go to some wrong places that you don't like, but that is where your success is. That is where your future is. I found that out. You got to walk into that future. You got to believe God. You got to trust him. That's what is called life of faith. Faith is not just to receive healing, let's receive some blessing and so on. Faith enables one to lay down his will and his ambitions, to walk into the will of God, to do the will of God, and walk in true success. So if you're trying to get life, 
never get it. Have you ever seen people trying to get it? They try so hard, they don't get it. But when you, the moment you come to Christ and say, not me, you Lord, you rule over me, you tell me, I give my life to you. That is when you begin to gain life. That's when your life becomes meaningful, purposeful, successful, <laughs> and it becomes full. <laughs> I guarantee you that. Secondly, so the problem of life. Don't put yourself in the center of your life. Put God in the center of your life. Do, don't do your will in your life, but do God's will in your life. Let it not be your life, let it be life given to him. Do it. That's the way to gain life. So life is something very big issue. And Jesus solves the riddle there. And then secondly, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will give man, what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? Now, next to life, the thing that man considers very important in this world, generally, is money. That's why the Bible teaches so much about money. And here, Jesus addresses that. In people's eyes, money is very important. Money is a big thing. And uh, Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? I mean, suppose you have enough money to buy the whole world. Just Try to check and buy everything that is, there, that is there in the whole world and yet lose your own soul. What will you give in exchange for your soul? In other words, he's saying if you gave everything that you have, you cannot get the salvation for your soul. All the money that you have cannot purchase that for you. So what is the value of money if it cannot buy your salvation? See, God is not against life. And God is not life against money also. In fact, God is interested in your life. That is why he's saying, don't live it for yourself, live it for me, then you'll have a good life. He wants you to have a good life. He's not against good life. He, he wants your life to do well. Be well. God is not against money. God actually gives money, I believe. The Bible says so. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, it adds no sorrow with it. Proverbs chapter 20, uh, 10 verse 22 says that. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. God is not against money. God is not against you having a lot of money or anything like that. No, He's not against that. But then what is He against? See, a lot of times what happens is when money comes, when God gives money, some people, what they do is they hang on to money and leave God out. Now money becomes the most important thing. And when that happens, when money becomes more important than God, money becomes your God. You see, that's what the Bible teaches. Now you've done violated the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. Now you got another God. You may say, well, I don't have any idols in my house. Oh, you may not have any idols. But you have some other stuff there. You know, that's the way the Bible teaches it. The Bible is a very profound, Bible presents very profound truths. God is not against money. God is not against wealth. People consider wealth as big thing. And God is for your wealth. God gives wealth. God made Abraham rich, the Bible says. And Isaac rich, and Jacob rich, and Joseph rich, and all that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the thing is, when wealth becomes our God, then that is when it's wrong. Instead of thinking that wealth is bigger than God, and concentrating on that, and forgetting God. When wealth comes, when you think about why has God given me so much wealth? Was, is there a purpose? Does God want me to do something? What does he want me to do with it? What is the purpose of wealth? What is the meaning of wealth? 
See, those things you will not get from the world. The world, you know what you will get from? They'll say, get all you can and can all you get and sit on your can, you know. And you think, what a bright idea. Man, you said it right. Thank God you said it to me. I've been spending it all on people, but I got to sit on my can. Get all I can, can all I get and sit on my can. That's the world's philosophy. That's what they teach about wealth. God says, He gives us wealth so that we may do what God wants us to do with it. So that we may be generous. We may be, do good works with it. Read the Bible. It says that. I don't have the time to read all those passages. Read 1, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, for example. It tells... Those who, those who are rich, let them be rich in good works, he says. Not enough to be rich, rich in good works. Be rich in good works, he says. But people are just satisfied that they're rich. <laughs> they're not worried about whether they're rich in good works. The Bible looks at the whole thing differently. So, money is a very important thing. Wealth is a very important thing. In that, we have to honor God. In that issue, we have to show that God is supreme. When it comes to life, we have to show that it's not our life. I listen to God. I want to follow God. I want to do what God wants. When it comes to wealth and money, I need to establish this fact that that doesn't rule me. That God is supreme. That is the reason. Now let me put it in perspective. That is the reason why the Bible talks about bringing the first and the best to God and giving it to God. Why? Why does God want our money? Eh? You think he's got, got some shortage? He's raising some funds? <laughs> no. The reason why he tells us to bring the first and the best. He's offended if, he's not bring, if you're not bringing the first, he says. First, I don't want the last. I don't want you to spend everything and if something is left over, bring something, you know. No. I want the first and the best. Why? Because the issue is wealth is very important in people's minds. And therefore, with regard to wealth, you must establish the fact that God is supreme. That God rules over my wealth. God is the giver of my wealth. He guides me in how to dispose my wealth. He guides me in the matter of my wealth. He is the one who has blessed me. And I will do with it what God wants me to do. You show that by giving to God first. That's how the Bible teaches it. Then the third issue. Third issue is verse 27. For, man, for, for the Son of Man will come in the, glory of, uh, in the glory of His Father with His angels and then He will reward each according to His works. What does this mean? This is talking about the third major issue of life and that is honor. Honor. So, the essence of life is these three things. One, it is life itself. Two, it is wealth. Three, it is honor. Life, wealth and honor. That's the essence of life according to human thinking. Man thinks like that. Life, wealth, honor. These three, three things make the essence of life as far as his thinking is concerned. And Jesus is addressing these things. He says, the, the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father and loses, uh, I mean, with His angels and then He will reward each according to His works. He's talking about a day when Jesus is going to return and He's going to be the judge and He will reward each according to His works. On that day, Are you going to receive honor from God? See, man is very concerned about honor from others in this world. People live for respect, to earn respect. Nothing wrong with that. See, nothing wrong with life. Trying to, you know, think that life must be good. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with wealth. To have wealth and enjoy wealth and so on. And nothing wrong with honor also. God wants us to live with honor. There's no doubt about it. But 
when you what is wrong with it is when you think man's honor is more important than god's honor and you live your life based on that that is wrong my friend see this is where things go wrong all three things god is not against all these three things god does not oppose god is for good life god is for wealth god is for honor but when you think it's your life and you live it the way you want to and when you think it's your money you do with it whatever you want to and even forget god because you got the money now and when you think it is man's honor that matters more than god's honor then that becomes wrong so he says when the son of man comes he's going to reward what is your reward going to be are you going to be honored on that day for what you have done every one of us have to live life based on that whether we're going to receive honor from him or not not worried so much about whether everybody here in this world honors us sometimes when you do the right thing the world does not honor you there are many people that have lived and died without honor in this world but whose life will be honored by god does god honor us do we live for god's honor do we consider god's honor more important than man's honor so these three issues now <laughs> moses is a perfect example of that it says moses refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter see i have not gone away from the subject don't think that i'm always on it moses is a classic example of what i described just now the three things the three issues major issues of life you'll see it in moses life moses experiences what is called self denial and taking up the cross literally what jesus was speaking about moses literally shows in his life he refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter and chooses rather to suffer affliction with the people of god see with those three, three things i talked about one of those one of the things that makes one of the things that makes those th- those three things very attractive is that our flesh loves it our flesh loves it this this part of our nature that is against god loves that my life it loves it flesh loves it frank sinatra song i do it my way sold a million copies you know everybody like i do it my way if he sang i'll do it god's way everybody said amen yeah hallelujah but he sang i did it my way my way my way is the highway million copies sold <laughs> because he loves it my way is the best way i like my way my plan my purpose i'll do it my way my hard earned money my power my ability my education my everything brought me this money well loves it lust of the flesh see my honor everybody should see me and honor me that's my aim in life what about god well i don't care about god we don't see him i want everybody that sees me honor me see that the flesh loves it it's the lust of the flesh and when moses walked out of the pharaoh's palace and refused to be called the son of pharaoh's daughter you know he was literally overcoming the lust of the flesh his flesh would have said stay here because here you got everything man you got life you got wealth you got honor all the three major things that everybody wants and looking for is right here in the palace you got a life you got wealth you got honor what such power why do you want to walk out he said no I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Faith is enabling him to do that. He believes God. Belief in God is not an ordinary thing. Faith is not an ordinary thing. It leads you to a higher kind of spiritual life. It leads you to true success. He walks out of there. He was not thrown out of there. 
Pharaoh's daughter didn't throw him out of there. He walked out voluntarily. Every fiber of his being would have told him, stay here because you got it made. And it was not a result of a rash impulse, you know. It was not an emotional decision to walk out of there. It was a studied decision. That's why I mentioned that in the beginning. It was a determination that he has made after considering very carefully all the options. It is something that has influenced his mind and his mind has finally decided. It was not a rash decision of a young man who just walked out of the palace, you know, in a moment of anger or something like that. No, he was 40 years old, Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 77, when he tells the story of the Jewish people, he adds Moses also in that story. And he says he was 40 years old and he started thinking about his brethren the children of Israel. Why did he all of a sudden, it's not that all of a sudden he started thinking about it. He has been thinking about it for a long time. When he was 40 years old, he decides to step out and do something about their problem. He decides to step out and take his position with them. He wants to identify with them. He wanted to be counted among them, not to be counted as Pharaoh's household. A member of the Pharaoh's household wanted to be counted among the people of God who are suffering out there. You know, Peter said to Jesus, remember one time, we, left, we have left all and have followed you. What all did he leave? He left some nets and some boats. He was a fisherman. <laughs> Ask Moses what he left. He left a palace. He left a life. He left wealth. He left a great future. He left honor. Respect, power. He, res he left a whole lot more than anybody else ever left. He left it all. So that walking out, literally in New Testament terms, you can say it's the overcoming of the flesh. Every part of his flesh would have said, stay here, enjoy it, man. You're a fool. Don't walk out. You got it all. Just continue. Just shut your mouth. You'll get your food on table, you know. You'll get all that you want. I can feel it standing here, what he would have felt. And faith and all that he has learned, that, that he studied and weighed, it has become a studied decision and a determination of his mind. He gets up, walks out, refuses to be called Pharaoh's daughter. So that's an instance of overcoming the flesh. Another thing that it is, is overcoming carnal thinking, the worldly thinking. You think people would have kept quiet when he was trying to go out? When he was trying to step out? If, any, if he had shared this with anybody, he would have told him, don't do that, man. Look what this lady has done for you. She has brought you into the palace. You would have died the moment you were born. God only brought you here. God only given you this palace life. God only has given you wealth. God only has given you honor. God only has given you such a life. Why do you want to walk out? You're a fool. Don't walk out. On top of it, you'll be a thankless person to forsake the daughter of Pharaoh and just walk out like that after eating her food and studying in their university and getting yourself trained and grown like this. You can't just walk out thanklessly. Carnality will give thousand reasons not to deny yourself and take up the cross. You try to deny yourself, take up the cross, it will never leave. Because the devil knows the moment a person denies himself, take up, takes up the cross, he will become a great, great success. He is headed towards great success. So the devil will try to stop it by all means. Don't do that, will be the suggestion. But he says, I can imagine what he would have said. He said, well, I can't stay here because these people are persecuting my people. My people have a call of God to go back to the land of Canaan. We got to leave here. We got to go back. These people are trying to kill our people. Pharaoh and his army are, are there to destroy our people, destroy our very existence in this world. I can't stay here to be against God. No matter how much they've done for me, I cannot, I cannot do that because it's against God. If it's against God, I'm not party to it. 
Some people say, well, Joseph did it. Joseph lay, stayed all his life in Egypt. He found no problem. Why can't Moses stay? Well, Joseph was called for a different purpose. He was sent there to stay there, provide for his family. The entire family moved there because of him. And God blessed him there. God's purposes were fulfilled. God's purpose was that he becomes an elevated person in position there in, in Pharaoh's kingdom there in Egypt and stay there and he stayed there almost a hundred years and served there successfully. Never came out of there. But even though he lived almost a hundred years, his mind and his desire was about the Canaan land which God had given to them. So he tells his brethren, one day God will meet you, take you out of this place. Remember to take my bones and bury them there, not leave here. I don't, I'm not an Egyptian. Even though I've lived a hundred years here. See, he's been there a hundred years, still doesn't feel like it's his home. His home is there. Take my bones, he says. Can you live in a country, in a place, in a culture eh? that is so different from what you believe and so on and still not become a part of it completely in your, in your thinking and in your ways? Can you be like Joseph? Can you be like Moses? Moses lived in the palace, palace, ate the palace food, went to their university. Bible says, literally says, he was learned in all of their wisdom. He was trained in their universities and learned in all of their wisdom. But yet, his mind was working differently because faith makes minds work differently. When you believe certain things, what you believe will affect you so much. That is why I say faith is so important. Faith is such an essential part of our life. What you believe is so important because it will help you make the right decision. Go the right way and have true success. So he didn't do it by impulse in a moment of anger or frustration. He walked out of there by faith, the Bible says, by faith. He was willing to walk out of all the wonderful things that he had because he believed that God has something greater for him. By going out, he'll never become a loser. That he's not going to lose anything. That he's going to walk into some greatness that the palace life will not provide. If he had stayed in the palace, he'd have gotten good food and clothes and some comfort. But he would not have become the Moses, the great leader that he became. And such a famous man who became the head of the nation of Israel he would not have become what he became in and through God's work in his life. So, God's will is the best. Don't you think so? <laughs> Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but chose rather to suffer affliction. He came out of there. It's not an easy thing. But he came out of there because faith, faith is knowing certain things true, you know, knowing certain things for sure. Now, a lot of people in the world have a wrong idea about faith. You know, they talk about leap of faith. They think you just jump in the darkness not knowing what there is. That's what faith is, you know. No. Faith is knowing exactly that God is there and that God will hold you and that you will be safe. You know it for sure. <laughs> you don't jump in the dark not knowing what's going to happen. That is a wrong idea of faith. Faith is certainty. Faith is surety. Assurance. Faith is evidence. So he walks out of there because of faith. He believes that God has greater things. God has better things. He's not a loser. He's going to win because of walking out there. And he walks out there and walks to where? <laughs> to a people who are suffering under Pharaoh in slavery, in bondage, working in utter poverty and in tears wanting to be delivered. He walks into those people. Now, <clears throat> that must be, must not, that to you and me, you know, we think, well, that's a tough thing. But if you have faith, you will do it. If you have faith, you will go into a place which is impossible, looks like hopeless, a situation which looks like hopeless, and you will turn that situation into something wonderful. If you have faith, you will not be afraid of what things look like where you're going. If you have faith, you will go into that and you will work in it 
and because of you and your faith everything will be turned around and it will become a great success that's how the bible tells the story of faith why is the author of hebrews telling these people these things about moses he's te- telling them because they're suffering they have been thrown out excommunicated from the jewish temple these people are jewish people and uh, to be jewish is a great thing important thing for them to be the children of abraham was very important to be a people of the covenant was very important to be part of the temple and all of its pro- pro- procedures and process was very important to them jewish religion was important but now they've been excommunicated they're out their privileges lost they're no more abraham's covenant people they're no more abraham's children they lost that privilege according to the jewish people look just imagine how they would have felt plus because of their faith in christ now they're losing their properties their jobs and they're persecuted they're having a lot of problems they're losing a lot in terms of money and so on but their friends back at the jewish religion are enjoying themselves they have wealth they have abundance and they're questioning saying what is this christian faith why am i in such great trouble and the author is writing he says be like moses don't have a short vision the pleasures of sin are for a season that means it's only for a short season that's what sin is all about everybody that sins sins for a reason do you know that maybe you don't know that they sin for a reason the reason is it gives them some pleasure sin gives pleasure but the problem is they don't know that pleasure is only for a short season very short time the suffering is going to be for eternity for a long long time in this earth and in eternity they don't realize that's why they want to sin they want to sin because it's pleasurable right now when you sin moses realized the pleasures of sin are for a season he looked at the future and what it holds they last forever he looked at the treasures of egypt and he says it's nothing it's nothing compared to the riches of following christ and living for christ and believing in god and walking in his will he compares the two and he chooses make the right choice i tell you this message is not just for the first century christians it's for christians in 2019 because such choices come to us every day every day we are faced with a choice are you going to deny yourself and follow i mean take up the cross are you going to think about the world as something big and the, the things of the world as something big or christ and his blessings as something big are you going to have a worldly mind to think about life and wealth and honor in the way the world thinks or are you going to think about it like god thinks every day we may not be going through persecution or suffering like those people went through but every day in very small matters in small ordinary matters of life we make decisions based on these two things we make choices between these two things and those choices show who we are and what we are what kind of christians you are you notice it every day you notice it there are choices there are decisions there are actions that you go through based on your choice between these two things what you chose shows what kind of a christian you are and i tell you may god help us to be the kind of person that moses was and paul was and that jesus expects us to be because that's the best way not our way god's way is the best shall we stand together amen Praise you, Jesus. Let's lift up our hands and give thanks to God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we, give, we come. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful grace upon our lives. Thank you for you have revealed to us this gospel. We thank you because there's opportunity to walk by faith with you. We thank you because we are not the people of the world, but we are the children of God. We are your people. We thank you because we think differently, do differently and walk differently and live differently. And I pray that people will see the results of such a living. 
that god will be supreme in their lives that they will not be like the world but they'll be like god's people they will live like jesus said and see the results of that kind of living the success the true success that it brings i pray for each and every one here people that are in need people that are in confusion people that are going through suffering exactly because of what we've been talking about you know they thought that life was their life they have to run it they are in control of it pray for those people that think like that i pray that they will turn around and give their life to jesus today that they will say not me lord you you rule over me you help me you turn my things around you give meaning to my life and purpose to my life may lives be turned around today because of the truths that they have heard that people be able to judge themselves to see where they are in their christian life and to make things right within themselves so god we give you all the glory because you are a great god and you have wonderful things in plan for us we thank you because any time we believe you and deny ourselves and take up the cross we can never be losers there is always victory at the end of the tunnel and we thank you for faith always brings victory in jesus name we pray now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of the father and the fellowship of the holy spirit abide with each and every one of us for now and forevermore amen